I'm Nan McKay with Kent Watkins, founder and chair of the American Academy of Housing and Communities. We would like to welcome you to the Community Trailblazers Academy Series. The Academy nominates people in the US and throughout the world who have significantly contributed to the betterment of cities. I think you will enjoy these stories from people who are really there in person. To stay up to date with our latest videos, subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscribe button above the video. This is Nan McKay, and I would like to introduce you today to Brian Green. Now, Brian is the Director of Fair Housing Policy at the National Association of Realtors, referred to as NAR. Brian re represents NAR on all fair housing related federal regulatory and legislative matters, advancing the interests of consumers and the real estate industry. He also serves as a staff executive of NAR's new 45 member fair housing policy committee. Before joining NAR, Brian served for 10 years as the highest ranking career official in HUD's Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, where he oversaw the policy direction and operational management of the 600 person office enforcing the nation's housing anti-discrimination laws. Brian also managed HUD's Fair Housing Assistance Program and HUD's Fair Housing Initiatives Program, which together provide over $70 million to state and local government agencies and nonprofit organizations fighting discrimination in local communities. So welcome, Brian Green. Thanks, Nan. It's great to be here. Now, Brian, you're a fellow in the American Academy of Housing and Communities, which is a tribute to your many accomplishments. What would you say is your most memorable accomplishment so far? Wow. So I've been in this work for almost 30 years, um, actually 30 years now, uh, one year at the National Association of Realtors. I have to think... You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you two quick ones that really stand out for me. One is uh, representing uh, the United States government on fair housing issues in Geneva. I had the opportunity to do that twice, actually, uh, to represent us, um, you know, bef uh, in Geneva before the, the UN Commission on Human Rights uh, to give testimony there. Uh, that I just you know, just, yeah, thought was really a pinnacle of my career. Um, and then the other quick one I'll mention is, um, you know, I spent my federal career enforcing the Fair Housing Act. And I think um, having the opportunity to invite the co-sponsor of the Fair Housing Act, Walter Mondale, to HUD and uh, to pick him up with my colleague in a car <laughs> and drive him from uh, Washington's National Airport uh, to his hotel uh, was an honor. Uh, and just to actually talk with this man who um, created this landmark civil rights law that I've spent my life enforcing. So I would, I would put those events up as the highlights of my career. Well, I can certainly relate to that because I oh, did right. all of my housing authority work in Minnesota. So Walter Mondale, you know, is an important name to me. That's great. I'd be the right. same way, you know, a little starstruck, like, Ooh, I get to talk to him. Yeah, we just let him out in front of his hotel. And we're like, you're sure you're fine here? And I'm like, looking around, it's like, folks, that's Walter Mondale standing out on the street in Washington. And Geneva, did you have time to do anything else while you were in Geneva? Because I love Switzerland. Yeah, um, great walks, first of all, and, so, and some running. Uh, and I, I did get to go um, take a train ride out of the city to see uh, a nearby castle. Uh, and just, you know, to see some of the, the hillside was beautiful. And their trains are fabulous. Yes. <laughs> 
So under your leadership as HUD's Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity General Deputy Assistant Secretary, uh, HUD pursued large scale, high profile cases that address systemic discrimination and provided widespread relief. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the cases that your department pursued? Sure. Um, so, you know, many people, you know, when they uh, face discrimination, aren't even aware that they're facing discrimination because they don't have the benefit of seeing how other people are treated. And so um, it's very important for the federal government to initiate cases based on evidence it collects or cases it develops, whether it's through fair housing testing, uh, where you compare how people are treated differently, or when you learn about discrimination so that you can make systemic change. Um, and so we did a lot of cases like that. Um, the one area I'll, I'll mention as a standout was the work that we did in the internet space. Um, I remember right after Katrina, uh, around 2005, a number of discriminatory ads were popping up on Craigslist mm -hmm. and Craigslist really didn't have any means for removing that content. And uh, of course that really pollutes the marketplace to have those kinds of ads out there creating a perception that, you know, it's okay to do this. And uh, most of our advertising uh, cases and the, the case law dealt with newspapers so we really had to deal with this pioneering space. And you know, there are other laws that deal with internet like the Com Communications Decency Act, which um, in a way immunize uh, a lot of these internet service providers uh, in terms of you know, uh, what, is, what third parties can put up there. And so I spent some time with Craigslist to get them to take some proactive steps, which they may not have had to do under law, but which were helpful uh, to the marketplace. And literally went out, you know, to San Francisco, sat in Craig's chair, <laughs> and you know, went over the operations with them and how they can uh, flag some of this discriminatory content and make sure it doesn't go up, and other affirmative steps they could take. Um, so, so that was a, a great highlight. And then shortly before I left HUD, um, we brought a case against Facebook um, for um, for allowing consumers to target housing ads based on race and other characteristics. So, you know, in the broad world of advertising, uh, it may be acceptable for people to choose a market and decide they're going to prioritize certain markets for their hair products or whatever, but you can't do that in housing or employment. And so we had to uh, get Facebook to do this right and to make sure that, uh, those targeting mechanisms were not available when it came to housing ads. So I'm very proud of those things. So do, I'm guessing between the lines that these were ads for rentals or ads for sales, one of the two for housing? Uh, yeah, yeah, it could have been both, you know, so, uh, you know, they allow you to post ads for, for either on both of those websites. And so we wanted to be sure that when it came to any housing or housing related advertisement, you know, as covered under the Federal Fair Housing Act, that they did not allow people to do that or allow those ads to, not to, you know, that they didn't allow discriminatory ads to go up and that they, at Facebook, they didn't allow the targeting. And since I've left HUD, you know, they've done a few more cases. I know Google um, also is making sure that people can't target ads based on those characteristics. So what did they say? Like, no, you know, only whites or what they say? So in the, uh, if we go back um, 15 years uh, to Katrina, yes, there were ads that people were putting up. Uh, we saw a lot, sadly, right after Katrina, uh, people who were um, opening up their homes and allowing people to rent from them or stay with them. And they were specifying what race of people uh, could, could stay. And then, you know, we looked beyond that and saw that other ads were going up um, where people were stating religious preferences, racial preferences, gender preferences, and it was just unregulated. Uh, and so it took a lot for uh, that to clear up. And then most recently with Facebook, 
uh, the ads would have, the, the content of the ads were fine. It's just that Facebook um, interprets the race of its users. Uh, you can actually go into settings and find out what race Facebook believes you are based on your uh, activity. <laughs> and so I believe they were using that data essentially to market to people, to advertisers and say, if you want to reach certain markets, we can use our analytics so that you can uh, target those folks. But it explicitly said, you know, check these boxes of, you know, what race or gender you want to see your ad or no, don't want to see your ad. And so we had to stop that. I would never have guessed that, that they have the analytics behind the scenes, but you know, I don't know why I wouldn't have, they're so big. <laughs> yeah. But wow. What would you say is the most prevalent discriminatory action in housing today? Is it the internet or are there other things? So, so I'm gonna have to twist that question a little bit because it's really hard to know based on what people report. And so I think the biggest issue is much of the discrimination is unseen. So at HUD, what we, knew, what we discerned every 10 years when we would do a national housing discrimination study was that uh, there was still racial steering uh, and um, differences in treatment based on race um, when people look to rent or buy. And that was based on tests, you know, where we would send people of different backgrounds. And, you know, in the last one that um, I oversaw in 2010, uh, people were shown units, but African-Americans, Hispanics, and Asians uh, were shown fewer units. And uh, often, uh, not often, but, uh, you know, significantly in a significant number of times, uh, charged more for units. Uh, sometimes they were not told about discounts that others were told about uh, and uh, sometimes steered. And so none of those people would have known, you know, um, that they were treated worse than someone else unless they had a friend or somebody else test it. Uh, and so likewise, you know, my first year in AR, this came up in, in Long Island uh, with New York Newsday investigation last uh, November. And again, it was through testing, through hidden camera testing, that we saw that African Americans were treated differently 49% of the time, Hispanics 39% of the time, and Asians 19% of the time. We wouldn't know that without that kind of evidence. And so to me, that is probably the biggest issue we're, we're, we're facing, there, that people are, for whatever reason, being treated differently, but that we don't necessarily know it because uh, individuals don't have um, the comparative evidence to report it. And so I think one of the biggest challenges that face us right now is as an industry telling people, hey, if you face discrimination, report it. Um, and you know, people can't report what they don't know. That's really interesting. And you wonder if that isn't just the tip of the iceberg. And if it is, then you, you certainly just can't have enough person power, manpower, to go around to all of these places to try to ferret it out. Maybe the, do you target the bigger complexes so that you get your numbers in a sense wider spread that way? Well, you know, I think one of the, the disappointments, um, you know, is that the federal government does not invest a lot of money uh, in this issue. And so, you know, I no longer work for the federal government, but, you know, my experience at the time was that testing was what was needed. And they're private for housing groups that do testing. They don't, I think the real estate industry thinks more of that goes on than actually does, which is maybe a good thing for deterrence, but there's really not a whole lot of funding for it. Department of Justice has a testing um, unit. Uh, I haven't seen many cases, although they did just bring uh, a racial discrimination case on Staten Island in New York uh, with some really uh, upsetting facts. Um, so, uh, so that's out there, um, but the funding is really not there. And so even now at NAR, you know, NAR has said, we don't want 
these practices in our industry, you know, uh, we don't want people wearing VR who are engaged in these practices. And so it was, it's not a big leap for us to say to the federal government, um, we support more funding for this. Um, most of the bills we see, even ones that propose to double the funding for fair housing activities are still, you know, uh, barely covering <laughs> the surface of what, what's out there. Um, so, so that's gonna be very important. What we're seeing this past year, just in terms of awakening to these issues and how many people, for example, in the real estate industry, you know, are now acquainted with Richard Rothstein's work, The Color of Law. I think, you know, and one of the reasons why I'm happy to be at NAR is um, there's a lot that we can do within the industry to just start changing our practices and to be more conscious of what we're doing. Uh, implicit bias training is one of the big things that I've launched. Uh, so to be able to just change the culture and address some of these issues, uh, you know, voluntarily, willingly, knowingly, um, is going to make the biggest difference. Um, but there has to be accountability as well. Well, what was your primary objective and your experience in pursuing and enforcing anti-discrimination laws in communities when you were with HUD? Yeah, you know, there a, a lot of the time it was, uh, you know, addressing what communities themselves were doing. Uh, you know, communities can take all manner of actions that can have a chilling effect on residents. Um, uh, one of the big cases I brought right before uh, I left was one against uh, a community out in California, uh, Hesperia, where... Um, you know, the evidence showed that police and other law enforcement were concerned about the changing demography, that uh, this community was becoming browner, both Hispanic and African American. And um, for a number of years in, in different communities, we, we've seen this increased either code enforcement uh, or pressure uh, on landlords uh, to report arrests, any kind of, you know, arrest, you know, an arrest doesn't mean that you actually did what you were accused of, um, but pressure on landlords uh, to adopt certain policies and practices uh, to limit who they would rent or sell to. And, um, you know, uh, and this, the, just the code enforcement. Uh, and in that one case, we were able to, to demonstrate that it was motivated by race and the effect of where they were actually uh, doing this enforcement or in, um, carrying out these policies, um, you know, was having a racial effect. Um, and that case, I know the Department of Justice uh, has since filed as well. So it, we're, we've been seeing a lot more of those cases throughout the country. Um, so that's one example of, of how, we're, how we were addressing that in communities. Well, you're now with the National Association of Realtors. And what are some of your goals in the new position? So um, one area that we want to focus attention on where we know it's going to take some time is to figure out um, the lawful and um, realistic way that agents can talk with clients about schools. Because um, very often when people are looking for homes, the conversation about the schools in the area come up. And sometimes agents uh, use it as a proxy for discussing the racial composition of a community. Sometimes inadvertently, it becomes a proxy um, because of school segregation and other factors. Uh, and, you know, there are many people who have advised real estate agents, just don't talk about schools, tell them, to, you know, contact the principal, which I think is a good idea. Um, but <clears throat> it's not against the law to talk about schools. The problem is people often go down the wrong road and you know, real estate agents don't necessarily, they're not necessarily experts in schools. And so some of the information that they may provide about schools is biased or, or, or is based on other people's impression of schools, which might be based just on the racial composition of the schools. Um, and then beyond that, some realtors, uh, or sorry, real estate agents um, may refer people to third party sources like um, Great Schools, a, co a company online. 
Um, but even those companies sometimes have very limited information about schools or just focused on test scores. And uh, my friend Richard Rothstein, who, who wrote The Color of Law, you know, he started his work um, as an education specialist. And when we've talked about this, you know, he says, you know, test scores don't reflect teaching and that many people get that wrong. And they think that if a school has strong test scores, it means that the school itself, you know, the teaching is strong when really it's more a factor of the parents' affluence and education levels and that those parents and those kids, even in a different school, might perform well too. <laughs> and so, um, so it ends up, you know, the, the, the emphasis on test scores ends up often um, steering based on socioeconomics. And so we want to find out just how we peel this onion, because it looks like agents are going to talk about schools, but we want to make sure that they talk about them accurately, reliably, and in a way that does not uh, sort of trip over Fair Housing Act concerns. One of the podcasts actually on community trailblazers that you might be very interested in is a person named James Lowen. <laughs> and he wrote Lies My Teachers Told Me and talks about how mm -hmm. the racial biases were almost programmed in within the school material for years. And it just gives a, a, and he's written many books, but he's, it just gives a very interesting perspective that I think you would enjoy listening to. Yes, I, I actually consider Jim Lowen a friend as well. And uh, I've invited him to speak at HUD several times. And, uh, you know, his book, Sundown Towns, has been, um, just, uh, you know, one of my top recommendations to people. And, you know, the HBO special that's on now, Lovecraft country um, draws on some of his research. Um, it's a sci-fi film about a sci-fi TV show about sundown towns. Um, so yeah, and, and, and that's you know still a phenomenon that this country has to address. I've been seeing a lot more people in this past year talk about sundown town history. Um, Glendale, California, just recently acknowledged its history as a sundown town and is apologizing for it. Um, I know somewhere in Indiana has. And so a number of countries are actually, sorry, countries, a number of communities are doing the work where they're um, going through their history and uh, you know, revealing how they came to be the communities that they are. But that's all, that's all fair housing work. That's stuff that we as the National Association of Realtors um, need to be engaged in. Well, it's really interesting. When I interviewed him, I started putting one and one together for myself. <laughs> and I started realizing that the town that I lived in, in Illinois, from the time I was, I don't know, maybe five until I was 14, I just feel sure was a sundown town. And I had never even thought about it until he started talking about it. And I thought, oh my gosh, I think it was. Did you look it up in the index of his book? He has all these towns listed. I think he said it was. Yeah. I think he knew it. And I think yeah. he said it was. <laughs> he's, he's, he's from Illinois. Sure. Yeah, he himself is from Illinois. And I, I, so, I, I, and so a lot, his book is very Illinois heavy, I noticed. I mean, it could have just be the fact of what was going on in Illinois. <laughs> yeah, probably for reason. Yeah. yeah, there's a story out. I saw a story just this past week. Uh, the Associated Press did a story about Vienna, Illinois, and its sundown history. I think Vienna is in southern Illinois. I'm not sure, but I think so. Yeah. And I think there were a lot of towns in mid-southern yeah. Illinois, at least, that yeah. probably were. They and maybe about, still are. Yeah. We don't even know. Yeah, right, right. They talk about Anna, Illinois, as well. Oh, yes. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, Jim Lowen, you know, in his advice uh, from years ago, is now becoming more relevant to many communities where um, he thinks communities with this history need to acknowledge it and then begin you know, a plan 
to demonstrate to the world that they're not that community anymore and that people are welcome to live there of all different backgrounds. In a sense, do marketing to let people know, you know, we are open because no doubt uh, people in those regions, they know if they don't know the details of the history, uh, they know that's a town that they shouldn't stop in or that's not a town that they would feel comfortable in. And so there needs to be some conscious effort to let people know they're a welcome place now. Absolutely. Now with NAR, you have a fair housing policy committee. So tell me what the agenda is for this year or next year. Yeah, well, um, a lot of it is um, carrying out uh, an initiative that I began uh, at the very beginning of this year that uh, we launched um, in response to the New York Newsday story, um, probably would have launched it anyhow, but it just so happened that <laughs> my third week on the job, this Newsday story came about and uh, kind of crystallized my focus. And we said that we need to do some steps to um, ensure accountability, culture change, and better training. And we called it ACT, an acronym for accountability, culture change, and training and put an exclamation point on the end. Uh, and it really sets forth some specific things we wanna do in each of those areas, including self-testing, you know, to get companies to test themselves uh, and see what their agents are doing and uh, rectify any problems. Um, it also has uh, uh, an effort to work with the state association executives to make sure that the state real estate licensing laws uh, are effective in how they're actually implemented. You know, when a New York Newsday story occurs, is there discipline at the state level? And if not, you know, what are the shortcomings of these state licensing laws? Uh, likewise, you know, what kind of training requirements are there? So we've done legal research to help uh, community, to help different states identify what makes a strong law. We're doing a lot of things related to culture, you know, um, highlighting leaders, and so we've got some films coming out uh, for our membership on that. And then training, we're doing um, implicit bias training um, really throughout the country uh, try to make that uh, a requirement uh, among agents. Uh, so we've got one of the top training groups doing that with us. And then we have an online training. Uh, so instead of having just classroom training, we want some online training where people are thrown into situations uh, interactive situations where they're challenged uh, to adhere to fair housing principles. So that's a big part of what this committee has been doing. Beyond that, we're looking at some big policy issues. You probably heard about the appraisal discrimination discussion in the country. Uh, New York Times did a big story two months ago about uh, a mixed race couple who uh, discovered that their first appraisal was really, really low when they had all their pictures up. <laughs> and then when the African-American wife and uh, child uh, left the home and you know hid all the pictures and any other evidence that African-Americans lived there, um, that the appraiser came back in to do a reappraisal and it was 40% higher. Um, and there's been a lot of research around this. Uh, and um, so there's an active conversation with, within the appraisal industry among the realtors and others on what can we do here? You know, is this implicit bias? Is there other, are there other factors we need to be looking at? So that's another big priority. Well, the important thing is bring it into the light. Yes, that's right. Discuss it, you know, uh, get the papers out there, get the research out there uh, and we'll figure it out. What do you feel is the biggest challenge in the housing and communities arena that we're facing today? You know, I think the biggest challenge is it will take time to undo the past, <laughs> that our communities are very, very segregated. You know, you and I talked about sundown towns. Those places are not gonna change overnight. Um, you know, places do change even within a decade, um, but you know, we, we, we do need to sort of do the work that we're doing now you know, it's helpful to have people reading Rothstein's book to understand, 
from whence we've come. Uh, but to, to overcome that legacy. Um, but I think it's really important that we do it because uh, we're reminded constantly uh, how that legacy affects many facets of our lives. And so, you know, when we shuttered our houses during COVID, you know, very soon we began to recognize that certain groups were disproportionately out there working um, and for other reasons, including their housing, um, finding themselves more susceptible, you know, either because they were, were living in, 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 multi, in uh, multi-generational situations, uh, often because of housing needs, uh, or because of where in town they lived or the history of access to healthcare. And so fair housing raises its head there. And then of course, you know, when we discuss these issues of, of police killings too, uh, our communities and who lives in those communities and how they're policed or uh, just the quality of the communities. Also, it's a fair housing issue. So we got all that on our plate. <laughs> well, and I've been concerned about, and in fact, uh, David Smith talked about this. You would also enjoy his second interview that I did with him on this. And the issue is what happens with schools, especially during COVID, those schools that you have to learn online. Yeah. Do they have internet in some of the lower income communities? And do they have a device of some kind to be able to share the information? Yeah, no, it's overwhelming to think of these issues. And, and I just have enormous respect for school districts that are, are navigating this. You know, when people complain about some glitch with the school district, I'm just like, <laughs> Just glad I'm not overseeing that. And glad you, uh, many people are glad they don't have to be the parent who is the teacher at home as That's well. Right. That's trying right. Trying to work and trying to get that done, which is very hard. Yeah, my sister-in-law is doing that. <laughs> you recently gave a talk on the pandemic and racism and NAR stance, and I would love to hear some of the takeaways on that. Yeah, well, um, no doubt um, we, you know, recognize during the pandemic that um, the work that we're doing under ACT is the bare minimum. Um, you know, ACT, which I described, is really focused on going forward, making sure that um, real estate agents do no harm. But um, to make real systemic change, uh, we have to um, redress the harm that's been done. And I think that is the big challenge. And I, I've said, you know, we, we need a second act. <laughs> uh, and that needs to focus more on uh, restorative justice policy. What, what can you legally do to recognize even the most recent uh, harm that has disproportionately affected certain communities? So for example, 15 years ago, the subprime and predatory lending crisis, which affected a you know, great number of communities nationwide, so much of the, the predatory actions were in communities of color. Uh, I grew up in, in New York, uh, southeastern Queens, um, just visiting my parents during that era. Um, you know, these were all middle class, uh, predominantly African American communities. Again, predominantly African American communities because of a history of segregation, and they were plastered with these, you know, um, leaflets. You know, offering to to buy homes and, uh, you know, um, home improvement scams. Uh, and my parents were, were, were called, you know, all the time and they were going to African-American churches and, and, uh, you know, when you look at where the predatory lending occurred in New York, it was in those communities, Southeast Queens. And then, you know, and when you look at it nationally, it was in, uh, it was concentrated in, you know, African-American neighborhoods of Cleveland and Detroit and, um, you know, any metro area you can go into, they were often preyed upon. So, um, 
so, you know, our ongoing geographical separation has left many communities um, vulnerable and, you know, it seems cyclical. <laughs> um, but I guess my point is some of this harm was recent and it just kind of happened. And then we said, all right, let's move on. Um, and so I think we, you know, if we're, we're doing this national reckoning, we should think about this, like, well, what about that? What about that stuff that just happened? You know, are we going to pretend that didn't happen? You know, we can point to again, specific, right? We could point to specific people who've been harmed. Uh, I know some agencies are, are even going back farther and just saying, well, what you know, what about urban renewal and some you know of those recent acts uh, where we know specific families who lost their businesses, lost their homes um, because of those city actions and didn't receive any or, or inappropriate uh, compensation. So I know like the city of Asheville is going through that conversation. Uh, I know for redlining and other issues that like Evanston, Illinois is having that conversation. I think the whole state of California is having that conversation. So we think these are important conversations to have. And again, you know, there may be differences of opinion, uh, but I would think at least for some of the more recent harm, um, it's an important question to ask. Well you know, why do we, you know, why do we just ignore it and keep saying, you know, we'll just start again. Um, you know, I think people are entitled to, to some attention for the harm that they suffered. And this probably ties in this question to what you were saying, but what do you think are the biggest challenges for leaders today? Um, I, I, I mean, a lot of it is education, uh, you know, getting people to understand uh, these issues in order to get support for the remedies to address them. Um, that's, I think, the biggest, biggest challenge. Um, you know, we at the National Association of Realtors strongly support um, all the provisions of the Fair Housing Act, including a provision um, that calls on communities to affirmatively further fair housing. And so one of the provisions that Walter Mondale and Edward Brooke, you know, wrote into the law was a recognition that uh, communities that receive federal dollars have an affirmative responsibility to promote fair housing. Uh, and, you know, when they wrote that in 1968, you know, the history was, right there you know they knew the communities were keeping people out uh and that all aspects of the community were working together to do that uh and that it wasn't enough just to say you know real estate agents stop discriminating or whatever the government had a, a big hand in it and if if all of our taxpayer dollars were going into those communities you know we could not stand by and let it be used to build up communities that we couldn't all live in. And so that provision in 1968 uh, really was enforced for just a short while. Uh, um, George Romney, the, the first secretary, well, the, the secretary of HUD, the first secretary after the passage of the Fair Housing Act really did push that provision of the law. Uh, and then he was asked to resign uh, by President Nixon and we really didn't see much of that enforcement for a long time. And then there was uh, a, a regulation under the Obama administration that sought to make something of it. And uh, Walter Mondale, when I met him said, yes, this is what we intended and we're glad to see it happening. Uh, and um, at the National Association of Realtors, we have supported it. Um, but unfortunately we saw just recently that uh, the Trump administration has decided that they aren't going to pursue it. And unfortunately, they've misstated really what it's about and have suggested it's about moving public housing to suburban communities. And that's not what it's about. Uh, it, it's, it's about cities looking within themselves. You know, it's, let's take the George Floyd, the city that George Floyd's from, Minneapolis, and the community that uh, that you know, or the state that you know, you know, in Minneapolis, just, just take the city of Minneapolis. The mayor of Minneapolis has a responsibility 
if they receive community development block grant funds and other federal funding um, to examine housing and development patterns in that city and to ensure that they don't perpetuate a history of segregation, that, that there's conscious effort to make sure that you're not building highways or uh, infrastructure to further uh, isolate communities or bifurcate them. You, know, you don't do urban renewal to destroy, you know, uh, communities where, you know, people haven't had a historical voice. So all of that is just within a jurisdiction that has nothing to do with the suburbs. Um, it has to do with communities getting federal funding, taking responsibility for their obligations under a 52 year old law. And we've, as, as the realtor said, this is important to us. We want thriving communities. We want our metropolises to welcome everybody, to be able to sell homes to anybody anywhere and for them to actually have the wherewithal to buy those homes and uh, you know, to, ret you know, to retain value in those homes. Just thinking about younger people and all your lessons that in a sense you have learned along the way, is there a life lesson that you would pass along to younger people today? Huh. <laughs> um, yeah, because I'm not young anymore. Um, <laughs> um, I got into this work when I was young. Um, you know, I, I think my approaches to things are less orthodox than many, um, which I think has been a good thing. Um, so my lesson might be sort of follow your passion and to sort of throw yourself into things and seek out the people who are doing the things that you want to do. Um, I think I've been very fortunate. I, I, I started um, my path on civil rights um, after taking a course with uh, Julian Bond, um, the civil rights activist, and one of the founders of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. I discovered then how little I knew about America's civil rights history and how directly relevant it was on my life and you know, how recent it was. Uh, and so that sort of led me into this work somewhat incidentally. I mean, I just sort of said, okay, well, maybe I'll do this. <laughs> And that life can sort of take those interesting turns. And I just kind of threw myself into it and interesting things would be happening in Washington. And I would call up to find out how can I go to this reception or how can I uh, attend this talk? And you develop friendships and you know, gather information which ends up being useful in unpredictable ways. And so I just think you know, I, I eschew all of the management books and leadership books and all that. I just kind of throw myself into stuff and follow uh, the, the, you know, just follow my passion and go up and talk to people who are doing the things that I'm, you know, interested in. And, and that sometimes is enough. I do think that we come to forks in the road every once in a while, and it's a major big decision we have to make. And I think how interesting that it takes us in one direction of life. And if we had taken a different fork, it would have taken us in a very different direction. And I think that's a little bit of what you're saying as well, that there have probably been some of those decisions as you started to pursue the history of civil rights, as you started to look at what could you do to make a difference? That's right. You know, and, 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 and I, I, I think, you know, I think those forks, I don't, I don't think you necessarily get lost if you take the wrong one. <laughs> um, that, you know, the roads may cross again, um, but it's almost the intent with which you follow it that leads you the right way. Um, you know, I've never been one to say, oh, I want to amass a fortune or anything like that. At the same time, you know, I've, you know, done well financially pursuing things that I, I love and opportunities have, you know, continued to open up. And it's largely been, I think, just the result of my taking a great interest in my work and pursuing it and, you know, just eagerly following it. Um, so I think that's 
really, you know, at the heart of, you know, what makes a career. And, I, and so that would be my best advice. It's been so much fun talking with you. You know, we've taken it into many different paths as we've gone along the interview. And I think back to the decisions you've made and how you have influenced so many people and so many things because of your policy decisions, the actions you had to take. And I'm sure some of those were not always easy actions or decisions yes. to make but that you have made a difference. And it's it, really wonderful to be able to look back over your shoulder and say, you know, I have made a difference, both in the public sector that you were in when you were working all those years with HUD. <laughs> and now, you know, in, a, in another sector that is kind of maybe quasi public private, but the point is that an, with this organization, you're being able to be that person out in front to lead them into some directions that will be positive for the country. So I really appreciate everything that you've said today, Brian. Thank you, Nan. It's been, it's been great talking with you. It has been. Thank you so much for participating. All right. <laughs> well, thanks. If you enjoyed this video, please join Kent and me and please subscribe free to this channel. Share it with your friends and click on the thumbs up icon to like us.